like a lot of people, uh, my journey with the Holy Spirit has been a long, long journey with a lot of misunderstanding and really lack of understanding. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I've shared before, I grew up kind of in the Catholic church. By that, I mean, I went to the Catholic school for elementary and we would receive a lot of instruction, a lot of instruction, some great, just regular subject, math, science, history, English. But we also had some biblical studies throughout my years there. And it, it created this really good, rich basis for my belief. Uh, and there was a lot that, that, I, that I carried to this day. Some of it I had to leave behind as, as, as I grew in relationship with Christ and understood theology. Uh, but they did teach me quite a bit of good, in particular, they did a really good job building this base about Jesus and, and the Trinity. I understood the idea of the Trinity, that God is three persons in one, just really what Craig shared two weeks ago. And I learned about the Father and his role, how he is the, the ultimate authority. He creates this plan of redemption. He's involved in the creation story. I had this really good picture of Jesus and how Jesus is uh, the, our Savior, that he comes to earth, lives this perfect life, dies on the cross, rises three days later, later defeating, uh, defeating death and sin. And through him, we have the gift of grace, which is eternal life. And then there was the Holy Spirit. And to be honest, um, I couldn't tell you really anything about the Holy Spirit. I don't really remember learning a thing about him. He was kind of the ignored, redheaded stepchild of the Trinity. There was really the one thing I learned about it. And it was actually this, this, this debate that, that was going on within the church. And it was this fierce debate. People had chosen sides. They were unwilling to waver. And this debate was really generational. And it was this. Is the Holy Spirit called the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost? And for the most part, the older generations at that parent point, like my great-grandparents' age, they were dead set that it was the Holy Ghost. And to change it to the Holy Spirit was to abandon tradition. And tradition is a huge part of the Catholic Church. And then the younger generations, they would say, oh, the Holy Spirit, it has to be the Holy Spirit because the Holy Ghost kind of brings forth this image of a, of a human with their spirit lingering beyond tormenting people. And people were, were upset when the other one was used. And it would go back and forth. But what I always found interesting is, is when I would ask kind of to hear about this Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, uh, what did he do? And I never got an answer to that. I could never find really anything else about the Holy Spirit other than this name debate. And as I left the Catholic Church, kind of went on and was influenced by these couple of guys uh, who really poured into me and led me down this, this journey with Christ, I came to this really different understanding of the Holy Spirit and I wish I could say it was good, but it wasn't. I started to believe this, this about this Holy Spirit. And I kind of just made this up as I went based on some really flawed understanding of Scripture. And I believed this idea that the Holy Spirit was guiding me, which is true, but he guided me in a very specific way. See, what I would believe was that the Holy Spirit, as I would go through life, he would just open doors. He would reveal opportunities to me. And my responsibility was to just step forward into them. And so what I did basically for my late teens to the early 20s is any opportunity that would present itself, I would say, well, that's God. And then I would just pursue it. And this led me to job after job. If somebody offered me a job, that must be God speaking. So I'll take that new job. Oh, this person offered me a, 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 an opportunity to live within an apartment. That must be God speaking. So I go after that. Or this girl shows interest in me. Well, I must, that must be God speaking. So I'm going to step through that door. And on and on. And, and I remember... One day I'm at work and I'm talking to this guy and he gives me some really unexpected advice because he's not a believer. I share this, this idea with him and he just kind of ponders it for a moment. He says, that's really, really dumb. <laughs> and I was defensive and I went home and I just, I just sat on that for a long time. And he was right. It was really, really dumb. This, that's not how God works. Sometimes opportunities in life, they're just opportunities. Not every door that is open in front of you is the work of God. And as I left this, this lack of understanding behind, I've gone on this journey of, of trying to have a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit, this God that indwells us and understanding how he works within me and with all, within all believers. And I've, I've really had a deep desire to understand it because when you look at the New Testament, there's a lot of ways in which the Holy Spirit works and a lot of Jesus promising that he's going to do things in you. And this, this one particular verse always stood out to me. It's John 14, 12 through 17. And this verse, the, kind of the context of it is Jesus is talking to the disciples. 
he's telling them that he's going to die. He's going to leave them soon. And the disciples, as they are throughout a lot of his ministry, they're like, no, you're not. You're not going to die. That's not right. That, that doesn't sound like the, the Messiah that I signed up for. We're not on board with that, Jesus. You can't go forward with this. I don't like this. They're hurt by it. And Jesus Jesus has the audacity to even say to them, not in this passage, but in another, as he's discussing this, he says, it's going to be advantageous for you. It's going to be better that I leave you. And I just look at that even now, 2,000 years later, knowing the truth. Like how unbelievable would that statement be? How is Jesus, God in the flesh, who walks beside you, going to be better for him to go? And that's what the disciples are feeling And then Jesus, he makes this really, really bold claim. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus just just lays it out and he says this, this, this statement that always just really resonated with me, but also just left me kind of awestruck and, and wondering, what, is, what does that even mean? He says, he says to the disciples, you will do greater works than these, that they will accomplish with the Holy Spirit and that they will accomplish greater works than Jesus ever did. And, and I'll just be honest, that, that blew my mind. That's always blown my mind. It doesn't really make sense because if you look back at what Jesus did, his ultimate work was dying on the cross and, and coming back to life, defeating death and sin, granting us eternal life. But up to this point, what he's accomplished in the story, he's, he's, he's turned water to wine. He's walked on water. He's calmed the storm. He's cast out demons. He's healed innumerable uh, diseases and illnesses. He's brought a man back to life. And Jesus is telling the disciples and ultimately telling us, you can do greater things than even this. And I look around throughout my life and, and through history, and I'm thinking, maybe there's some miracles. I do believe in miracles. There's miracles that match this power, but exceed it. I, I just, I haven't seen it or heard of it. And it really came down to this misunderstanding of this verse. When he says greater works, he's not talking about greater works in power. He's speaking to greater in impact. It's like this math, this, this, this simple statement of facts of math. One person versus 12 people, or really all disciples for all time, hundreds, thousands, millions, are going to be able to reach people directly in a way that Jesus never could. Jesus, yes, fully God, fully human, comes down to earth, but he submits to the restriction that you and I, we all have to live under. That is, we can only exist in one place at one time. And so Jesus' is impact, while amazing, and, and ultimately the impact that any of, the, of us that we can make is done through him, but he's restricted to only the people he could be around. And he says to them, you will have greater impact because this is going to be a multiplicative movement. You, these disciples right in front of him, the disciples that are going to be birthed out of the early church and and through all the generations, you can reach places and people that don't exist right there in a way that Jesus couldn't. And I I, I like to think of weird things, so I always thought, well, that's really a bold claim still because like how many people does it take to equal one Jesus, to equal one God in the flesh? like 12? Is it all the people alive then? Or is it all the people, the millions of people throughout the generations? But even that doesn't really answer the question because Jesus is saying, it's not really about you guys. It's not about me in and of myself. Are you in and of yourself? It's that the Holy Spirit is going to indwell you and empower you. It is all believers walking around as the temple of God, living out the mission of Christ, right? Empowered by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we can have greater impact as we go out living and sharing the gospel. And he makes this, as he's talking about this, he's talking about this Holy Spirit that's going to go and be with us and and work through us. And he kind of gives it this name and this title, this helper. He refers to it not just as the Holy Spirit, but the helper, that we are going to be indwelled by the helper. 
And depending on the translation, maybe you have a different translation in front of you. It can be read as uh, helper or, or advocate or counselor or comforter or intercessor. And it comes from this Greek word, parakletos. And, it, and it's this, this difficult word to translate because it really translates well to all of these different things. The Holy Spirit working in our lives is really multi-layered in what he can accomplish. But you and I have this helper that, that indwells us, that works through us. And I always just wanted to know throughout my life, what does that actually mean? How does this helper actually help us? And so I wanted to take some time. I really wanted to go through the Bible and just, just share with you some of the ways that I see it. I really wanted to stick to some of the more commonplace ones, the ones I see more often experienced, but also the ones I see that people really, uh, in, in my time, both in ministry without really are desiring the Spirit to do within them and through them. And so we're going to take a look through a couple spots in the book of Acts. We're going to look at how the Holy Spirit works through the disciples as they plant the early church and really how that can play out in our lives. So the first place we're going to go to, Acts 4.29, excuse me, yeah, Acts 4.29 through 31. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. One of the ways in which the Holy Spirit helps us that he lives out this parakletos is the Spirit gives us the power to testify. He gives us the ability to take forth the gospel and share it in a broken world that desperately needs a Savior. And it starts out, it's not in this passage, but it starts out, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is he testifies to us. He reminds us of truth. He applies the gospel to our lives as we listen and abide in him. But then he takes that and then he uses that through us to testify to people in our lives. And what we see in this passage is, is the Holy Church, what it says is they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. These disciples, they're planning the, the, the church and they're going into all of these lands filled with both Jews and Gentiles and they're sharing the gospel, the word of God with boldness. And they're doing it as people are opposing them, sometimes under the threat of death. They're losing their jobs. What we see as the church grows, they're, they're, they're being persecuted and yet they continue to preach the word with boldness. And we see this not just in this passage, but if you look through Acts time and time again, they talk about how they have the boldness to go up and proclaim under threat. They have the ability to speak the gospel in a way that is understood by the people around them. It's repeated throughout basically all the New Testament, how one of the ways the Spirit works in us is that we can share the gospel. And really what he does is he gives us both the will and the way, the ability to say it, but also the willpower to do it. And that's what's happening here. They have this boldness to speak the word of God. The Holy Spirit, as they're trusting on him, he's giving them this bravery, this, this willingness to go forth and proclaim Jesus. And it's the same ability that he gives us that we can go in our communities, we can go where we live, work and play and share with broken, lost people the truth of Jesus. And, and I'll just, I don't know about you, but for me, like, that is just a terrifying prospect often to go and share Jesus. I know some of you sitting here today, you can talk to anybody at any time, anywhere about anything and you don't care. But for the rest of us, like the idea of sharing something openly with another person is, is like the worst thing we could ever imagine because it, we, we have this impression that it can come at a cost and it can come at a cost. We can lose relationships. We can be judged. We can, we can have somebody completely ignore it. We, can, we carry this weight that's not really for us to carry. We have this belief that it's all upon us and if we don't do it right, somehow we're going to fail God. 
And it, what happens is we focus on ourselves instead of focusing on the spirit within us. He's the one who's going to do the work. We're just joining him in what he's already doing. It's what we talk about again and again in the blessed rhythm. It's not about us. It's about allowing the spirit to work through us and joining him in his work. And he doesn't just give us this willpower. He really gives us the way to accomplish this. What we see throughout Acts and throughout the other, some of the epistles is he talks, it talks about how the Holy Spirit really gives us the words to say. And I always viewed that as, well, he's just going to make pop up in my mind any part of scripture, scripture maybe that I hadn't read at the time. He's just going to just bring it to my mind. And, and I don't want to say the Spirit can't do that. But how it often works is more of this recall of knowledge. Right? The, relying on the Spirit doesn't allow us to live complacency in our journey of, of studying scripture and communing with God but he can bring forth knowledge. And I think what it really means, this, this, bringing, this, this giving us the words to share the gospel, in my experience, has been that it's, it's the ability to take the gospel and apply it in a way that works in somebody's life. To make it not just words that are said, but applicable, this living, breathing word of God that affects somebody and meets them where they are at in their lives. The Spirit allows us to do that. He's the one doing the work. We're just focusing on him and allowing him to work through us. And that's what the church was doing. They were in touch with the spirit. They were allowing him to be the focal point while they just, they just followed. They trusted and they, they let the spirit empower them in their words. We are people helping people find and follow Jesus. We need to be a people who rely on the spirit to give us the power to testify and share the gospel. We'll jump forward now. We'll jump forward now, actually exactly four chapters to Acts 8, 29 through 31. And it says, And the Spirit said to Philip, well, just to give a little backstory, actually, what is happening? Philip, he's a disciple. He's involved in, in the early church spreading the gospel. And right before this, what actually happens is Philip is kind of just uh, trying to figure out what he's supposed to do. And the an angel of the Lord appears. And you're going to go, Philip. You're going to go down this road. Uh, you're going to travel on it. It's a road that he would not have taken at the time. But he trusts uh, the message from God. And he goes down this road. And it says, the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And ultimately what happens, Philip, Philip explains what's happening. He shares that Jesus is in fact the Messiah and this man converts. He gives his life to Christ. But what we see in there is, is, is Philip is allowing the Spirit to guide him. And it's what the Holy Spirit can do with us. He can give us guidance. Right? He, he literally hears from the Spirit that says, go do this. And he's living a lifestyle that allows him to have space to hear from the Spirit. And he lives a lifestyle that when he hears it, he responds immediately. What, what's kind of interesting is, He's almost living out the blessed rhythm. And now, I don't know if he's beginning each morning with prayer saying, Spirit, tell me what to do. Uh, what we do know about the early church is, is spending time in prayer is a big part of their life. So I don't think it's a huge reach. But then what's he do? He hears the Spirit. He sees where the Spirit is already working, right? This guy, he has this Bible that he's trying to understand, this, 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 this copy of Isaiah. He has no idea what's going on. The Spirit's already working. Philip hears the prompting of the Spirit. He responds. He goes to this guy, and then he listens. He listens and hears what he's reading. He asks them a question. Do you understand? He doesn't assume. He listens again and again, and eventually the guy says, no, I don't. And he sees his opportunity. He sees how the Spirit is working, and he joins him in his work, and he serves him by explaining it, and then ultimately he shares the gospel with him. Yeah, he skips over the E, and, and in this particular case, it just it rapid fires, but he's living that out before this blessed rhythm is even created. He's trusting in the Spirit. He's listening. He's serving. He's sharing. But ultimately, what he's doing is he's allowing the Spirit to guide his life. And in all my time of living, really what I was living out in a very uh, flawed way, is that we want to be guided by the Spirit. 
more than anything that I've probably heard about the Holy Spirit is people saying, I really want direction from the Spirit. I want to know what I'm supposed to do. I want to know His will, His plan for my life. How do I respond to this situation? Do I, how to have discernment about what to choose? And I really just wanted to spend a couple minutes kind of diving into some ways in which we can listen to the Spirit. And it doesn't come directly from here. These, these couple of ways, they come from actually... Uh, uh, some of it is scriptural based. Some of it is is my experience and the experience of pastors and scholars and what they've written about and really uh, some experiences that I've gathered from people who are deeply in tune with the Spirit. But there's really two things, two ways in which we can uh, quite easily gain guidance for the Spirit. And the first one is listening, which kind of seems uh, in, uh, obvious. If you're going to hear from the Spirit, you have to listen. But what I'm really trying to get at is do, do you have a rhythm of life in which you can listen to the Spirit speak? Because what I've seen, what research really backs up is that we, uh, as in America, in Western society, we are a people who have this constant, overwhelming, unhealthy amount of input, both audioly and visually, uh, just bombarding us. From the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, we're just being just fed information. All right? How many of us, we have our, our cell phone by the bed and we wake up in the morning, we turn off our alarm and the first thing we're on Facebook or Instagram or Reddit or, or the news, whatever it may be, reading. Uh, we, we're <clears throat> talking with our family. We're getting in the car. We're putting on music or a podcast or whatever else there is. We're at work. And then how many people th that we know at this point that they can't even go to the bathroom without taking the phone with them because sitting in silence for a couple minutes is the most terrifying thing in the world. And then they come home from work or we come home from work, we go home, the TV's on, uh, songs are on, uh, uh, the internet, our game is on. And we finally go to bed as we're scrolling through our phone while we sit in bed. Just, just all day, all day, every day, just this constant, constant, constant feed of information. And what I wonder is where in that time do we have any time to listen to, to the Holy Spirit? What we saw of Jesus, one of his practices and one of the practices that was, that was very strongly held in the early church was this rhythm of silence and solitude, this removing of oneself from, from people, from the noise, just to go sit in silence and solitude. Yes, pray to God, but also just sit and listen. It's one of the ways in which we can hear guidance from God is to create spaces in our lives, not where we're just speaking to God, but then just allowing him to speak back to us. I've been blessed in my life a couple of times to have experienced this the last time. Um, the last time this happened in my life, uh, it, was, it was several years ago. As many people know, uh, Jamie and I, we've been, we've been doing foster care. And in this particular time, what had happened is, is two of our kids, two kids that had been living with us for over a year, uh, they both went home. They both actually went home uh, really unexpectedly. Uh, even a month prior to this, we were expecting uh, to adopt them. And they went home actually on the same day. They weren't related. They went home to their separate parents on the same day. And it was crushing. It was, it was, we were devastated. This was our family. We viewed them as our son and daughter. We loved them. They loved us. And they were going home. And we just sat in this time of just grief and wrestling. And finally, we had gotten through that. We were still, you know, grief doesn't fully go away for a long time. But we, we were finally through that like initial phase of overwhelming grief. And, and we're just kind of settling into this new rhythm of life. We went from six to four people in our family. And we're at this time wrestling. Are we going to continue with foster care? And at this point, we're in the story. Jamie has gotten to the point. She's ready to continue. And I'm, I'm just not there. I'm not there yet. I'm still like, I don't, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. In fact, I'm leaning towards no. And this wasn't like a contentious thing. This was just a wrestling that we were both, both having and kind of helping each other walk through. And I remember this specific day, we're both sitting in the living room, just kind of hanging out. And Jamie gets a phone call and it becomes immediately apparent that it's DHS. 
and they're calling and they're, they're explaining. I'm kind of overhearing it. And they have this, 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 these, this, these two kids and they need a home for them. And, and one of them's a baby. And I'm like standing up. I'm like, no, absolutely. And I'm shaking my head, like telling Jamie, just, just hang up the phone and just tell him, no, I'm not interested. And she's getting all this information. And she's, and she ends the conversation. Well, I'll talk with Drew and, and we'll get back to you. And so she shares with me more and, and, I'll just be honest. I'm, I'm still angry. I'm still angry in that moment. I, I cannot stand DHS. I don't want to work with them anymore. And I tell her, nope, you just call them back. You tell them no. And Jamie says, okay, I, I will. And in that moment, I just say, you know what? Actually, I just, I just need some time. I just need some time. You can just be patient. And I, what I did at this moment was really odd because what I normally do when I'm just in that moment of just like wrestling and struggling with, with thoughts, I often throw in my headphones and go do some physical labor. Instead, this time what I did is I went into our room and I, and I just sat there and I prayed. I prayed a really simple prayer. God, what, what am I supposed to do in this moment? And then not intentionally, I, I just did. I just, for whatever reason, just sat there. I sat there in silence. And after this period of time, I don't know how long it was, I heard this voice that just said, this is what I have for you. And it was a voice that was not mine. It wasn't audible from the outside. It was just, just like something, it was just, I believe fully, it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And the moment I heard it, this, this, this peace just overwhelmed me. It just drained all the stress and energy out of my body. And I just had this peace that this is what God was, had for our lives. I wasn't, I was not to say no. And I went out and I shared with Jamie and just said, hey, it's, it, yes, call him back, tell him we'll take the kids. I wouldn't have experienced that. I wouldn't have what God has had for our lives if I didn't take time just to sit and listen and allow the Holy Spirit to speak into my life. And what was amazing is that that greater impact, that greater impact came out of that. I allowed myself to listen and allowed the Holy Spirit to work and it's changed my life and Jamie's life, my family's life. It's changed kids' lives and, and, and it's had far-reaching uh, consequences outside of that. Do you listen? Do you have time or margin? Do you have a rhythm of life that allows you to listen to God? And the second thing I see that a way that we can receive guidance is through conviction. I actually believe uh, from what I've seen in my, um, throughout my life is uh, the way the Spirit most commonly speaks is through conviction. That he is, doesn't necessarily give us words. He just gives us this deep soul wrestling, this, 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 <clears throat> this holy discontent often. And it's this conviction that comes in two ways, either to, 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 to recognize a sin in our life and repent and allow the Spirit to transform us, or it's this conviction that you're supposed to step into something or sometimes remove yourself from something in life according to God's plan for you. And what I see uh, of society is we have become a people who are uh, afraid, unwilling to allow conviction in our life because what we quickly do is we take this conviction and we twist it and, 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 and view it as condemnation. We've gotten to a point where we can't ever just sit and feel uncomfortable or uneasy about something because then, it, then it's an attack on our identity and we can't ever have that. And really it is an identity problem. We have an identity wrapped up in ourselves, in our feelings, instead of an identity in Christ. But one of the ways the Spirit speaks to us is through that conviction, that soul wrestling, that mental, physical, just spiritual wrestling that we have to just sit and work through and we have to stop pushing it aside or burying it or numbing it or whatever practice that we like to do in response to it. And we need to be able to just sit in that conviction and allow the Spirit to speak to us and lead us where He is moving. We are a people who is, are so focused so focused on comfort. And actually it was a, I believe it's P.T. Barnum. He at one point said, comfort is the enemy of progress. And he wasn't talking about spiritual things, but I think it's true here. We push aside conviction for the sake of comfort. And this comfort is often preventing us from being transformed by the Spirit, from, being, uh, uh, from allowing the Spirit to impact people through our lives. We're impeding the work of the Spirit because we have this, this desire to be comfortable. 
And the spirit doesn't work through always comfort. He works through this conviction. Are you stepping into this conviction? If we are to be a people helping people find and follow Jesus, we need to be a people who are allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us. We, we cannot dis, be discipled or, or disciple other people in our own power. It requires us to live uh, responding to the Spirit within us. Are you allowing that to happen? Are you allowing Him to guide you? Are you allowing Him to work through you sharing the gospel? So I'm going to go ahead and release to the campuses. I love you guys. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for sticking around uh, for our transformational moment. We've been looking at uh, this, this blessed rhythm. We spent some time really looking at the be that. Begin with prayer, uh, allowing the Spirit, praying to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit to, to, to make evident where He's working in other people's lives, where we can join Him. And today, just I want to spend a minute just talking about the next step, which is listen. Listen. That is, listen to the person He is leading you to. To be a person not, not just ready to thrust the gospel upon them, not to just recite this thing that you learned at church or at school uh, about a gospel presentation, but be a person who listens to what they have to say. Before somebody is willing to listen to you, they need to be fully heard. What we saw with Philip today, Philip in Acts, he goes, he's led to this Ethiopian, and he had time and time again, he listens to what's going on in this man's life. He, he doesn't assume, he doesn't barge in with the gospel. He listens to this man. He's listening to the Holy Spirit as he listens to the Ethiopian. And when he sees his opportunity, a guy really reaching, this guy's really ready because he's just diving in to Isaiah. He, he then gets to the point of sharing the gospel. But it first starts with listening. And as we're doing all of these steps, listening, eating, serving, sharing, we're listening and responding to the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys. Have a great day.